gran placer de estar con ustedes hoy y, y charlar acerca de este proyecto y estudio mío, uh, lo que uh, ya para muchos años uh, tengo investigaciones acerca de los dirigibles y también el transporte de los productos uh, perecederos uh, aquí en Canadá. Soy el director del Instituto de Transporte y nosotros uh, tenemos mucho interés en el transporte, sin embargo, eh, todavía no tenemos muy bien conexiones con México y es uh, muy bueno haber uh, un red tan grande de las universidades aquí en ese uh, um, <ríe> proyecto. <ríe> o, o, otra vez, uh, tengo que uh, charlar más en inglés en mi proyecto, tal vez. <ríe> No, muchas gracias, Barry. Mira, para nosotros es un honor que hayas aceptado darnos esta conferencia, sobre todo eh, de las personas que están conectadas, que es un buen número. Habrá muchos interesados, por supuesto, en el tema de los dirigibles de carga. Sabemos que están conectados tomadores de decisión de empresas y gobierno. Y, por supuesto, eh, académicos, estudiantes que están pues digamos, ansiosos de conocer sobre estos temas que efectivamente en México no, no tenemos todavía tanta información. Pero gracias a tu conferencia, seguramente que mucho se va a despertar eh, al respecto. Si me permites, Barry, voy a, a presentarte y posteriormente, bueno, pa pasaríamos a tu conferencia. El doctor Luis nos va a dar su conferencia en inglés. Por supuesto, con mucho gusto vamos a, a estar atentos. El doctor Barry Prantis, eh, pues él es profesor de la Universidad de Manitoba. Él es, como ya lo mencionó, director del Instituto de Transporte. Bueno, es reconocido internacionalmente como pionero en el desarrollo de este tema de dirigibles de transporte de carga. Profesor de administración de la cadena de suministro en la Escuela de Negocios de la Universidad de Manitoba. Y pues también él, eh, en 1999 la National Transportation Week lo nombró persona del año en el transporte de Manitoba. Ha jugado un papel decisivo en la fundación del Departamento de Administración de la Cadena de Suministro en la Escuela de Negocios y de la cual ahora pues este, esta, eh, esta misma escuela pues ofrece títulos de pregado y posgrado en, en esta área. Bueno, también él ha sido nombrado miembro honorario vitalicio del Foro Canadiense de Investigación en Transporte y desde 2015 es asociado en transporte en el Northern Policy Institute. Eh, Barry, pues tienes una trayectoria increíble y pues no queremos este, abarcar demasiado tiempo. Seguramente que simplemente con tu ponencia mucha curiosidad se va a generar. Así que espero que la página de la universidad donde esté tu biografía sea robusta porque va a haber muchos clics para conocer tu trabajo. Muchas gracias, Barry. Pues eh, adelante, por favor, con, con tu ponencia. Muchas gracias. Eh, ah, tengo que uh, uh, usar mi... Uh, to share. I need to have the permission to share the screen. Sí, claro. Permíteme, voy a... Eh, voy a buscar ahora te he hecho eh, co-host entonces ah, podrías compartir uh -huh. well Thank you very much again for the uh, wonderful invitation to speak to you today. It is a, a great pleasure for me, uh, partly because I've had a, a very long interest in Mexico. Uh, I think uh, my first trip was over 50 years ago, and I've traveled many times uh, to Mexico. So I have a very good sense of the, the size of the country, its, its regions, and its potential. Uh, in fact, I'm also very pleased that over that period of time, I've seen such amazing progress in Mexico to the extent that uh, today uh, Mexico is, is literally a, a modern country that uh, 
that stands uh, head and shoulders with uh, all uh, the rest of the developed world. And, and this is so pleasing to see. Uh, my work uh, in transport covers all the modes of transport. I work in rail, trucking, air, marine, and so on. And I'm interested in all modes of transport. Uh, at the same time, I'm also very concerned about the environment. And we only have to listen to the news to hear the kinds of very violent and larger storms, uh, hurricanes, which are coming today, in fact, uh, over Cuba and into Mexico. Uh, we had a very devastating storm in Eastern Canada, a, a record storm. We've never seen a kind of storm of, of this magnitude. And of course, the heat waves that are affecting Europe and, and other places, the drought in the West, this is not something that we can any longer deny. Uh, we have to come to grips with the emissions of carbon and transport is one of the worst offenders. Uh, roughly 25% of all the carbon emissions uh, in the world are coming from transport. It's also one of the very most difficult uh, areas in which to reduce carbon emissions because we need a mobile fuel. Uh, we, we can't have a long extension cord of electricity to uh, drive a, a truck. Uh, we are working on this obviously with batteries and with hydrogen, but it's gonna take a long time uh, before that comes uh, uh, into the mainstream. And of course, what that means is that more carbon is going to be emitted. Things are likely to get much worse before they get better. But we must start now changing. And so this uh, analysis, which I am presenting, is one of those opportunities. Uh, we know that long haul trucking is a, a very large source of carbon emissions. And I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, what I'm going to refer to is the a possibility, and it's a very real possibility. This is not just a, an academic dream. Uh, this is a reality that is uh, being put into place as we speak uh, with people around the world who are working on this technology to bring back cargo or airships uh, for cargo use uh, and, and widespread uh, uh, efforts around the world. So my title, as you can see, uh, Dera Hibles para Carga versus uh, Autotransporte de Carga, Huela de Carbón y Competencia. Uh, I'm going to compare trucking and uh, the airships for the movement of uh, tomatoes as our uh, topic uh, for analysis from Mexico to Canada. This map uh, illustrates the temperature zones that we see uh, in North America. Uh, what you can observe is that all of Canada is in this cold zone. Uh, we have a, a very serious winter every year and uh, with lots of snow and, uh, and cold temperatures. And of course, the further south you go, the, the nicer the weather becomes. And of course, we at this time of year all think about uh, returning to Mexico like the geese who fly there every year because uh, we like to escape the cold, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we can't. Uh, but in any case, these climate zones mean that we can grow different agricultural products in different places. Uh, we are a, a place that has one season and we grow very large quantities of wheat and corn and other grain products, uh, but we only have a very short season to grow any fruits and vegetables. At the same time, uh, what you can see is uh, if you come to Canada, you would think this was a tropical country. You go to our stores and you see them packed with all kinds of fruits and vegetables and uh, wonderful things to eat. And of course, uh, many of these products are coming from Mexico. They're, they're, they don't come from Canada in the winter time. So uh, they have to be transported and that transportation uh, takes a lot of energy and produces a lot of carbon. Uh, this is another illustration of the movements to Canada for fruit imports. Uh, what you can see is that 77% is coming from the United States, uh, only 18% from Mexico. And of course, uh, we have uh, for vegetables, uh, sorry, that is, 
as you can see that uh, tomatoes are 11% of all of our imports. So it's a very large quantity, but peppers as well, uh, increasingly coming from Mexico uh, and other vegetables. And of course, on the fruit imports, it's a similar story uh, where the uh, production is coming mainly from the United States. Uh, Mexico is only 8.5% of our fruit imports, which seems rather small uh, at this point. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's a very important trade between Canada and Mexico. Uh, one of the things that has happened over time in Canada and the United States as well, is this notion of eating uh, locally. This word locavores is a, a new invented word, which means uh, essentially local consumption. And uh, there was a, a book that was printed called The 100 Mile Diet. Uh, people tried to live on food that was uh, coming from no further away than 100 miles. Uh, the desire for this was mainly for fresh product and, and to support the local economy. Uh, the, the quality of the product that we receive by trucks, it, it looks very nice, but often it doesn't have a lot of flavor. And uh, people don't believe it is quite as, as healthy as it actually looks. Uh, there's also uh, the recognition that came out of this uh, analysis or this movement, I guess you'd call it, uh, was that transportation was a large source of carbon emissions. So if you could eat more locally, there'd be less transportation. And as a result of that, uh, less carbon emissions. So this was a, a desire that people had. And of course, uh, it also initiated a wider analysis of what are the carbon emissions of the food that we produce and, and how uh, um, important is transportation in uh, carbon emissions. This is a table that came from uh, Ritchie, a study they had done from world data. I'm not sure it applies to any particular place, but it gives you a relative right, sense of uh, how important uh, different food products are in terms of their, their carbon emissions. At the very top, uh, we have uh, beef, uh, carne de res, uh, the uh, cattle. Uh, most of this is from their, their burping. Uh, um, and that is just a, a matter of how they uh, they digest the the fodder and how they uh, they grow. So they produce the most of all the carbon emissions. Uh, and then we have some other uh, livestock uh, products. Uh, uh, carne de cerdo is another uh, lesser one, but you're consuming a lot of grain. It takes a lot of energy to produce that grain. On and on down. But we can see is that the very bottom is uh, the, the fruits and vegetables. And in fact, uh, it looks like they are pretty benign that if uh, we only ate fruits and vegetables, we would remove a lot of the carbon emissions. At least it looks that way in this chart. But if you start to examine what is the carbon emissions from transport, uh, what we can see is that the in in terms of the carbon emissions, most of the carbon emissions for fruits and vegetables is coming from transport. So as an example, in the case of bananas, 35% of all the carbon that's uh, emitted in the, in the movement and consumption of bananas comes from transport and all the way down the line. And of course, the, the reason is they're being moved in these uh, refrigerated tractor trailers. Uh, the refrigerated trucks, uh, uh, burn a lot of fuel to move, but also uh, in order to power this refrigeration unit, they're continuously burning fuel as well. So it has both uh, those uh, sources of carbon emissions. Uh, if we look at this, sort of what are the numbers? Well, in terms of Canada, I'm sure this must be hard to believe sitting in Mexico, but uh, we import 3.2 million tons of fruits and vegetables every year. It's a, it's a tremendous number. Uh, in order to do that, we have 160,000 trucks that uh, cross uh, the US uh, from Mexico, but also from the US, of course, and come to Canada 
uh, to reach us. So uh, a very long distance uh, moves of many trucks. Uh, average distance would be about 3,000 kilometers, maybe 3,500 kilometers coming from Mexico. And each of those truck trips would generate 3.8 tons of carbon emissions. I always have a hard time understanding what that really means because, you know, 3.8 million tons, how big is that? Because you don't see the carbon emissions, uh, they're there. Uh, well, in total for the year, we got almost a million, 600,000 tons of carbon emissions. But to put that in perspective, if you wanted to remove that carbon from the air, you'd have to have almost 10 million trees growing for 10 years in order just to take that carbon back out of the air. So it is a, a very large amount of, of carbon indeed, just to move that one uh, area of our consumption, which is fruits and vegetables. Uh, there's a notion generally that, well, you know, the dirigibles the, the or the airships, uh, they, they can't compete with trucks. I um, mean, the roads are already in place. Uh, the roads are basically free to the truckers. Uh, the trucks themselves uh, are not overly expensive um, and uh, they're used everywhere. So how can a, an aircraft such as an airship possibly compete uh, with a, a truck? Uh, the picture on the left, this is an actual uh, Dirigible that is being built or has been built now um, in the United States uh, by the founder of Google. Uh, Sergey Brin is one of the proponents of airships and he's using his own money, it's not Google's money, although he's got lots of it, uh, to build uh, an airship. So this is a rigid airship. It has a frame, as you can see. Uh, it's not complete, obviously it is now, but uh, it has a cover over it, and inside there are gas cells, so there may be uh, 12 um, of these bags that would hold the gas, and that's what gives it the, uh, the lift. Uh, so we are seeing airships coming on, and you can also see from the, the size of, this is a man standing there, so you get a sense of how big this uh, machine is. It's probably 100 and, well, I was going to say uh, maybe 50 meters long. Uh, relatively small though in airship terms. This is the hangar it's in. Obviously, you could build a, an airship that is much, much bigger than this one. And, and of course, they have it already in, in plans to do so. Uh, I'm an economist by training. So I look at the economics of these things and, and consider uh, different aspects, such as how do vehicles compete with each other in terms of, of size? Obviously, we know that uh, airships are uh, get much better as they get bigger. So if you start increasing the size of an airship, its costs decline as the airships get bigger. Uh, the trucks, of course, cannot get bigger. Uh, the roads are only so wide. The bridges are so high. And you can't get them any longer. So the actual long uh, run costs of trucks is flat. Uh, they're not gonna get better uh, with time any more than they are today. As the airships get bigger, there's gonna be some point at which the airships will compete with the trucks. So we were looking to see, well, where is that point at which the airships now can compete with trucks? And of course, uh, uh, that's the nature of the study. Uh, the second aspect is that, well, Trucks are very good for short distances. If you're going to move something only 100 kilometers, you'd never use an airship for that. Uh, and a truck, of course, it goes door to door. So they're very convenient. So everybody likes trucks, uh, especially for short distances. And indeed, uh, even if you have airships, it'll likely start on a truck to get to the airship. And after the airship arrives, it'll move on a truck to the store because that's the way our distribution systems work. The first mile and the last mile typically are done in a truck. But if you look at distance, then just per kilometer, uh, the truck costs keep rising. So the further you go, uh, the more it costs. And so this is the marginal cost of the trucks. Uh, the airships, 
uh, are actually very inexpensive to fly. Uh, they're expensive, of course, to build. Any aircraft is. But once you start flying, uh, they don't cost much per mile because the lift is free. It's provided by the lifting gas. And they only have to push them through the air. And of course, it doesn't take that much energy to do that. So uh, as the distances are long, the cost of the airship increases but not nearly as fast as trucks do. So again, there's some distance at which the airships and the trucks will compete. Uh, and we'll see that we, we talk about uh, the study details. Uh, this line only considers what the trucks pay. And you know, the trucks pay for their diesel fuel, they pay for their driver and, mm -hmm. and the truck itself and so on, but they don't pay for the carbon emissions, uh, at least not yet. Uh, we are seeing that here in Canada, we do have a, a tax now on the carbon that, that the, everybody has to pay when they buy fuel. But if you consider what are the costs of those carbon emissions, then the, the cost line for the trucks would rise to this uh, dash line. And therefore, the distance of competition would also shift to the left so that the uh, airships and the trucks would compete at a, another distance. We didn't look at this in terms of the study. We only looked at this number because obviously you first need to compete in terms of costs before you consider some of the other benefits uh, that would be there with the airship. So this is our study. I'm, we're coming from Winnipeg right here in the center of, uh, of the continent, in fact and the center of Canada East-West, uh, there is greenhouse tomatoes or venaderos in uh, Ontario and in Vancouver. So we receive uh, domestic uh, tomatoes uh, even during the winter time uh, from the greenhouses. And of course, our other sources of consumption are coming from California, uh, from Sinaloa, Sonora, Sinaloa uh, from Florida. And we looked at Aguas Calientes as a, a location in Mexico. There's a, a large amount of, of a greenhouse or venadero uh, production occurring in this area and in, increasing in time. And uh, the, one of the members of our study was uh, a, a student, a graduate student from Aguas Calientes who was visiting in Canada. So we decided, well, we'll look at Aguas Calientes as our alternative point uh, versus these other traditional areas of, of production and, uh, for tomatoes that come to Canada. And naturally, of course, uh, uh, the uh, cost of getting here, we would uh, move out through McCallum and then straight up uh, to Canada. So this would be the truck route uh, competing, which is not too much different. The, the airship, of course, would go straight uh, line from one place to the next. This is a uh, illustration of what the supply chain looks like. If we consider uh, tomatoes at the present time coming from uh, Mexico, obviously there is some kind of a, a package shed or, or location where they're, they're prepared to be uh, put in boxes to load onto trucks to ship to Canada. Uh, they would come to the US border. At this point, uh, the Mexican trucks are not permitted to cross the US to come all the way to Canada. So they are unloaded at a location, Nogales and, uh, and McCallum are the two main locations. So the trucks are unloaded and all the boxes are loaded into this uh, a warehouse uh, near the border, at the border uh, with the US and Mexico. Subsequently, uh, trucks pick those up and then they come across the, the Canada US border. This is a very small stop. And then they move to a warehouse uh, in Canada and of course uh, are unloaded and then moved out to the various uh, supermarkets. So that's the typical supply chain. Uh, this takes roughly four days. Uh, it's basically a day to come to the uh, border. Uh, there's another day lost in crossing the border and in the warehouse or more, depending. And then there's another uh, two days at least to get across the US and make it to Canada. So. This supply chain is roughly four days long. If we were using an airship, uh, the location is probably going to be very close to the packing sheds. It may be uh, 
some uh, distance to drive, 20 or 30 kilometers, depending on where the production is. Uh, but there would be a location where the airship would pick up everything. It flies straight to Canada. Uh, we even envision the possibility that the, the airship might land on the roof of the warehouse as opposed to uh, someplace else and unload directly into the warehouse, which would save time and, and be more convenient, uh, certainly in the colder temperatures. In any case, then the things get back on a truck and get out to the supermarket. Uh, this process, uh, the, the flight time at least, would take 20 hours. Uh, and it would be obviously only one quarter of the time for the uh, truck supply chain. Uh, in looking at this, these trucks carry 20 tons. That's the regulation in the U.S. in terms of the weight limits on the roads. Uh, this airship would carry, and we're looking at one, would carry 100 tons. So each airship would be like five trucks. These are some of the costs that uh, we came upon in our study. Uh, this was done in 2020, so uh, some of the prices may look a little different than they would today uh, because obviously uh, fuel prices have gone up and down. But the trucking to uh, uh, Tamaulipas uh, from, from Aguas Calientes to the border, uh, 2000, uh, these are all in uh, uh, US dollars. Uh, then there's the customs clearance, uh, drayage across the border, the aduana, uh, and, and maybe other fees that we didn't catch. And then finally, there is the movement from McCallum uh, to Winnipeg. This cost also includes that warehouse cost that's going on because we can't really see what that cost is. We, we only know at this end uh, what people pay. But the total logistics cost uh, from start to finish uh, for a truckload of tomatoes uh, is $11,867, or as it works out, roughly 59 cents per kilogram uh, is what it costs to move tomatoes from Mexico uh, to Canada. This is the, again, uh, type of airship we're talking about. As you can see, as the other picture, it has a frame all the way around, and you can see the actual gas cells inside the, uh, the, uh, the frame of the airship. Uh, this is uh, a, a picture of what would have been the old German Zeppelins, uh, the giant airships that were flying in the 1930s, some 85 years ago. Uh, with modern materials, uh, this size of airship, and we're looking actually at the Hindenburg as our model. Uh, the reason for that is that we know a lot about it. We know how fast it went, uh, we know how much fuel it burned. Uh, we know uh, how much it carried, what it weighed. So we have a pretty good idea of what the cost would be for a uh, an airship of this size. Uh, we're looking at a 100-ton cargo lift. Um, a vehicle this size will lift roughly 200 tons in total, but we are assuming 100 tons is the uh, the weight of the airship itself. That's the dead weight and then 100 tons of cargo, which is a fairly uh, conservative estimate. In terms of our operating assumptions, uh, the cruising speed of the airship, uh, the old Zeppelins would go at 80 miles an hour or 135 kilometers. Uh, we're not sure if this is as fast as it should could go or would go, because uh, there's two pos or three possibilities. One is this was the the best speed to go in terms of uh, fuel consumption. Another possibility is that that's as fast as they could go given the, the engines that they had at the time. And there's always this concern about weight in an airship. You, you have to trade off the weight of the engines and the fuel versus the cargo. So you, you don't want to uh, uh, have uh, too much weight on the, on the engines in order to maximize your cargo. In any case, uh, the other possibility is that they were worried about the, the structure. Uh, they had no computers in the 1930s. In fact, the, the whole airship was built with nothing more than a slide rule. So they weren't certain as to what stresses the, the airship could take. So they didn't push them harder than 135 kilometers an hour. We've used that same number today, uh, although we suspect that probably it would go faster. 
Uh, the cargo payload mentioned 100 tons. Uh, useful life, 25 years. Um, we believe they'd be able to operate uh, just about all year round. They need some time for uh, obviously inspections and maintenance, but especially when you're moving long haul and you're moving uh, uh, continuous uh, flying 24, you know, day and night, uh, getting 330 days a year and uh, and uh, daily flying time of 20 hours uh, would not be that difficult. Uh, this means that we only have about two hours on either end to load and unload. And of course, you want to do that quickly regardless. Uh, airplanes, they usually allow about an hour. So again, this is within reason. Uh, fuel consumption is coming from the old Hindenburg. So we use the same uh, number. And of course, uh, utilization, you always fly full if you, you, map, you have to. If you don't have cargo, you need to put on... Uh, uh, water ballast because you need to maintain the constant weight. And then we have a crew size. We assume three per uh, airship and three crews in rotation. So it'll give us uh, some cost and numbers. These are our cost assumptions. Uh, insurance of $5 million a year. Uh, wages, of course, uh, per person, 100000 The fuel cost is only $1 a litre at that time. Uh, and inspection, ground handling costs. And the purchase price of the airship at 100 million. Again, this number has to be uh, um, taken with a grain of salt, as, as it were. We, we're not sure of that price, but given the costs of building airships uh, in general, we think that is a, a reasonable cost. If you take the flying time and the speed and the cargo capacity, you can come up with an output for the year, which would be 89.1 million ton kilometers. So this is uh, maybe that many tons, one kilometer, uh, or whatever combination of that gives you uh, that number. These are the fixed costs. Uh, again, the aircraft is going to be amortized, obviously, over that period of time. Uh, the insurance is every year, administration, maintenance. So the annual fixed costs come out to be about $14 million per year for the airship. And then we have variable costs for crews, fuel, and other, uh, giving us a total of some uh, 20 million, if you add these uh, two together, total costs for the airship. Based on this average output of 89.1 million ton kilometers, the cost per ton kilometer is 0.23 uh, cents, uh, or sorry, 23 cents per uh, ton kilometer. Uh, this is uh, in the range of trucking. Trucking generally is a, a little bit less than that, but that's in the range. And then the cost of moving fresh vegetables all the way from uh, for 3,000 kilometers uh, would be $69,000 or 69 cents per kilometer, or sorry, per kilogram, my apologies. So, uh, what does it tell us? Well, it says that the airship is 10 cents a kilogram more than trucking tomatoes from Mexico to Canada. So in terms of the cost, based on these assumptions, uh, maybe the airship has to be a little bit bigger. And it wouldn't be hard to make the airship uh, uh, 150 tons in size rather than 100. And of course, uh, the cost would fall more. So that magic point somewhere on that diagram where the, the two compete uh, is not very far off from the 100-ton size airship. However, the airship has some other advantages. Uh, we're looking at using electrical power for the airship. Uh, one of the big advantages of an airship is it's such a large vehicle that there's lots of space to store hydrogen uh, as a gas uh, to use for fuel, and you can put that through a, a carbon or a, uh, a fuel cell and produce electricity. And that gives you zero carbon emissions. So unlike the truck, which is uh, producing uh, these massive amounts of carbon emissions, the airship could actually produce zero carbon emissions, which would be a, a tremendous uh, advantage. Uh, it also has a vibrationless ride. The, the airship just smoothly flows like a, uh, uh, a cloud, uh, literally. Uh, they are so large that they don't have any uh, turbulence. You don't feel those like a small airplane uh, and vibration 
Whereas if we compare that to a truck, uh, anyone who's actually uh, uh, ridden in a large truck, you'll realize that there's a lot of bouncing goes on, a lot of jiggling. Uh, this has two impacts. Uh, uh, one, of course, is it can damage uh, the, the perishable product inside, but it also means you cannot ship products that are as ripe. You have to ship products that are more green stage. And one of the reasons that the tomatoes uh, don't have the flavor in the wintertime that we expect in the summertime uh, we, from our own gardens is that they're picked green and then they are forced to turn red uh, once they get here by gassing them. So they, they really don't, they lose a lot of the quality because they have to be designed to uh, move a long distance in this kind of a bumpy uh, road. Uh, space is also important depending on the product you need to have air moving around these perishables in order for them to breathe. Uh, if they don't get enough air, then they start to turn brown. And, and we see this in terms of the products that come. Uh, typically, perhaps also you'll see this in Mexico. Uh, lettuce, uh, if you look at the end of the lettuce, it's turning brown. Well, that's because it's been starved for oxygen and it's actually died. So more air circulation you can have, the better. And of course, in airships are very large, so there's lots of way you can spread the product out and, and have good air circulation. Clearly, it's gonna be fresher, one day versus four by truck. And the other is to avoid trade barriers. This is a topic that I think is very pertinent to this uh, audience. You know, if we think about uh, crossing uh, from Mexico into the US, uh, this is a picture of one of those uh, locations. and it kind of speaks to the congestion of everybody waiting to get across to, on this side uh, and a kind of a barrier that's there to get through. Well, there's several kinds of barriers. Uh, one of them is being created by this little fellow, a Mediterranean fruit fly. As a result of the Mediterranean fruit fly uh, being found in Mexico, no citrus uh, no oranges or mandarinas are allowed to come uh, through Mexico uh, and we don't, sorry, through the U.S. So we never see these in Canada. Uh, in fact, I've never ever found um, any citrus products other than limes uh, in the, uh, the stores in Canada that come from Mexico. Uh, of course, we also have uh, barriers against tomatoes. Uh, the U.S. has a number of uh, programs that they apply to, to protect their own farmers and, of course, affects the exports from Mexico. The advantage of the airships is we fly right over all of this. So it would be possible to move products from uh, Mexico directly to Canada uh, that we don't even see today, uh, as well as things that would be fresher. So some conclusions. Uh, First is that long haul trucking, they produce a lot of emissions. This is not a, a topic that has really been brought to the public attention very much. We're, we're so dependent on truck transport, nobody even wants to talk about it. But the reality is that it's one of the major sources of carbon emissions, which is contributing to the climate change that we're seeing all around us. The second is that the airships could offer point to point delivery, not just from uh, where we see production today, but we could extend production from further south and from areas that are, are uh, unable to export because of delays. I'm thinking, for example, of Chiapas and uh, of uh, the area uh, in southern Mexico where I've seen very large orchards of mangoes and, and other tropical fruit. Uh, we never see those products reaching Canada because of the long transportation distances and the time it takes. So if you had airships, they could fly directly from Coaxacoalacos or, or wherever uh, location we decide would be the best place to pick up and fly straight up to Canada. And so this would enable Mexico to expand the, the reach of its uh, uh, production for tropical fruits uh, and vegetables coming to Canada. And of course, if airships were available, you would not only consider Canada. Uh, th those same mongoose could fly over to, uh, to Europe uh, just as easily or to uh, the Middle East or many other places in the world would be very happy to receive uh, fresh uh, 
products from Mexico by airship. Uh, clearly, the avoiding the long delays, which uh, affect the quality, and of course the non-tariff barriers, these barriers that are put up uh, by the by the U.S. that prevent things crossing border, those would all be avoided. Uh, it would also open up two-way trade. Uh, greater quantities of temperate zone foods. Uh, Canada actually exports a lot of uh, pork or carne de cerdo uh, to Mexico. Uh, it comes down by truck as well. This would shift over to the airship. And uh, obviously, fresher product is always nicer. Uh, so uh, there would be two-way moves. And of course, uh, Canada would be moving other products uh, to Mexico and, and reducing the cost of trade, which it helps uh, everybody, consumers and exporters all the way around. And then finally, uh, for us in Canada, in the middle of the, the winter, uh, the product that we're receiving wouldn't just look like tomatoes. If transported by airships, they would actually taste like tomatoes. So there would be a great improvement of the, the flavor and the quality that we have. So we look at this and say, why are we doing this? Why is uh, Canada and Mexico not embracing uh, this new technology? Because certainly it would have great benefits for both of our countries. Uh, we'd receive much better quality products uh, from Mexico. And of course, uh, it would expand the exports uh, from Mexico. And there would be things that were going back uh, that we ship anyway. Uh, but we'd do this uh, in an airship that would be electrical, uh, non-polluting, and would be much better for the environment. Uh, before I stop and, and open the, the, uh, the presentation to some questions, I want to just show you three more slides. You know, there's a statement that everything that's old is new again. And if we look at the 1920s, you could here's a picture of a, a young girl who is putting a, a power uh, into an electric car in the 1920s. And here we have a modern day young lady who is also powering up an electric car. So the electric cars were very uh, much present. You could buy them commercially in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, and then they disappeared completely. And uh, everybody thought, well, you know, we don't need those anymore. They're, they don't have the range. Uh, Gasoline cars are, are faster, cheaper, whatever, and therefore nobody wanted electric cars, so they abandoned the electric car. And then about 10 years ago, people started to say, wait a minute, I think we need to reduce our carbon emissions, and electric cars would be good. And today, uh, we're seeing a tremendous rise in the production of electric cars, and some places even passing laws to say they will not allow gasoline cars to be uh, sold uh, after a certain period of time, you know, maybe five or 10 uh, years from now. But nonetheless, the, the movement is uh, today very strongly towards the electric cars. Uh, these windmills uh, were very common in, uh, in North America uh, in 1920s. Uh, there was no power grid that people could use. So out in the countryside, they they use these uh, uh, windmills and had batteries and, and operating and so on. But of course, when the uh, electrical grid was extended to the countryside and throughout the cities, and we had uh, coal-fired uh, generating plants and coal was cheap, uh, producing electricity was much less expensive and continuous. So everybody abandoned. Uh, these windmills. Today, uh, they're back and it's like that rainbow, this is the, the pot of gold at the end of this rainbow, is a wind turbine. And indeed, we see them again. I was in uh, Selena Cruz uh, and is an amazing amount of wind turbines in the isthmus uh, at Selena Cruz. It's astounding. I don't think I've ever seen it as many in one place before. And of course, they're all turning and generating power continuously. So this technology was abandoned and they're back. And here we have the airships. In the 1920s, this airship is called the Los Angeles. It was built by the Germans and purchased by the Americans as a, a training vehicle. And uh, it flew successfully for some uh, 20 years. 
Uh, it was finally dismantled uh, after they had moved on to airplanes. And, uh, and why did they go to airplanes? Well, fuel was cheap and uh, the airplanes were faster and certainly they were better for aggressive activity like, the, like uh, fighting a war. And of course, during the war, Along came the, the jet engines and the jet airplanes, which were much faster. Uh, and nobody wanted to build airships again because now we had jet airplanes. And uh, of course, the jet airplanes didn't just outcompete the airships. Uh, they outcompeted the, uh, the railways as well as the ocean liners. So uh, they destroyed everything that was a uh, competition. And we called that era the jet age. Well, the jet age is now over. Uh, in fact, the people producing jet airplanes are, are working very hard to try and find a way to reduce their carbon emissions because they're such a, a large source of carbon emissions. And uh, therefore they are uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, produce battery powered or hydrogen powered airplanes uh, it doesn't work very well because there's no space to put the fuel tanks and allow that to happen. And here we have a modern airship. This airship was actually built in the year 2000 to celebrate the Zeppelin's uh, uh, first airship. Uh, it looks the same, same shape, but of course it's entirely different. It's made with carbon fiber and advanced materials uh, that this one does not have. And of course, uh, we're seeing now plans to build bigger and bigger airships. So with that, I will stop and uh, my presentation and I will turn the audience back if you have some questions. Barry, thank you very much for your nice presentation. In fact, we have many different questions in Spanish and in English and by YouTube, WhatsApp, etc. So um, I will start with the, the first one. Uh, it comes from a colleague, which is uh, who is working in a private company, and the question is: uh, At what height do these airships fly? Well, the optimum height, of course, depends on uh, what the terrain is like. Uh, you want to fly, generally speaking, as low as you can because the air is thicker. And if the air is thicker, you get more lift, you can carry more. So the higher you go with the airship, the less you can carry. Uh, but the typical flying height is about um, under 2,000 meters. So, for example, uh, uh, you'd be very close to the ground at uh, San Luis Potosi. Uh, but you could still fly there, and then you can lift off and fly. But... The notion is that the higher you go, the less you can lift. So you want to fly relatively slow. Uh, this does mean you're below the clouds. It does mean that you're in the weather. So you have to be more concerned about the weather than you do with a jet airplane flying high up. However, they're very, very big machines. So they don't move around very much in the wind and the weather. So they, they're fairly stable. At least this is what we have observed. And of course, today, we have good weather forecasting, so we can know where the storms are. You don't fly into the thunderstorm. You're going to fly around it or, or take a different route. So they, even though they fly low, uh, relatively low, uh, they're quite safe. Thank you, Barry. You know, the, the next question is, in, in this uh, regionalization phase of the supply chains, what do you think is the role that the airships will play? Well, it's going to be mainly for long haul transport. Uh, certainly uh, crossing oceans is the best uh, because if you look at crossing the Atlantic Ocean, you've only got two options. Very fast airplanes, which are very expensive, or very slow ships, which are cheap, but they're very slow. And there's nothing in between. There's nothing that goes at truck speeds and truck costs. So the airship really competes in that part of the category crossing water bodies. So Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean, we see these as one of the biggest uh, two markets, but of course we also have the long distance from Mexico to Canada. So coming from Mexico to Canada would be a competitive area or from anywhere in South America. 
to Canada or from Mexico to South America. I mean, the airships can also fly south. They don't have to just fly north from Mexico. And uh, so there would be uh, trade throughout the Americas, uh, north, south. The other place that we are looking at them very seriously in Canada is where we have no roads. And the north of Canada, uh, roughly 70% of all of Canada's north has no roads. So we have great difficulty getting to, for example, developing uh, mineral deposits for mines or serving these communities. It's very expensive to transport to the north. So we're looking at the airships to fly there as well. So remote areas, islands, for example, is another area that are very isolated. So airships that serve the islands would be a competitive area. You know, we, we don't want to oversell the notion of airships. We're, airships are not going to do everything, but they've got certain areas where they're very, very good and very competitive. And uh, no, this is the one that I just talked about. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you know our colleague, Mauricio Villalobos, uh, who is working at uh, IBM, um, um, he says, uh, I see it may represent an opportunity for supply chains concerned with security in roads as well, where escorted uh, trucks cost uh, much more. Yeah. That's right. It, uh, it is true. Question? Oh, sorry. And that's true. In fact, uh, one of the places where there's been a lot of interest in the airships is in Africa. Uh, there's some countries that have like uh, the Congo, which has really good mineral deposits, but to get out to ship them someplace, you've got to go through areas where there's lots of people with guns. <laughs> and so the risk of, of getting your product out, if you could fly over it, obviously that makes it safer. So he's absolutely right. There's some areas where uh, just in terms of security, they would make a lot of sense. Yeah, that's right. Um, Barry, uh, there is another question. Uh, what kind of regulations the countries should standardize to use airships internationally? Well, I think one of the things we need to do is to return to the use of hydrogen. And uh, one of the regulations that exists in Canada and the U.S., is a ban on the use of hydrogen as a lifting gas. Uh, you have to use only helium. Hydrogen is much cheaper. Uh, it's much better. You get 8% uh, more lift. Uh, and of course, uh, it's available everywhere. You can make it anywhere you need it. So hydrogen is much better. It's also the case that in the US, uh, it was banned 100 years ago because the people producing helium lobbied the U.S. government to pass a law to ban the use of hydrogen. Uh, there's no science or engineering reason why we shouldn't use hydrogen. And in fact, uh, I don't know about Mexico, but in Canada, we're now using hydrogen in so many places for, you know, the forklift trucks uh, in, in our warehouses are now powered with hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, we have buses using hydrogen. And, and of course, the cars, it's more battery powered, but some places, like Japan, is all hydrogen cars. So we're using hydrogen everywhere except this one place. So that regulation has to change. Um, the Europeans, they have uh, called EASA, E-A-S-A, which is the European regulations for, for airships. They have new regulations now for giant airships, which are passed. They make no restriction for the use of hydrogen. So we're going to probably see it come back first in Europe uh, because that's where a lot of airships are being developed. But uh, the regulations really have to be brought up to date. In Canada, we have no regulations to train pilots. So, you know, how do we have pilots? Uh, you know, it's just simple things like that because it's like a brand new transportation technology. So we have to have all these regulations in place that aren't there today. And so, there is a real important role for government in that. Okay. Uh, Barry, you know, talking to maybe future investors, what do you think uh, are the main challenges for uh, someone trying to create a transportation company based in airships? Well, I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with just confidence. You know, people have to believe 
that this actually works and it makes sense. It's becoming much easier now because, of course, we have the climate change reason to do this, even if no other reason than that. But it also is the case that, you know, everybody always likes to see somebody else doing it first. Nobody wants to be the first. They want to see somebody else do it and then they can do it. So, you know, we we have this restriction of, of who wants to be first. So, you know, it's also, though, if you're brave and you're the first one in, look at Tesla uh, and Elon Musk. You know, everybody said, oh, it'll never work. It never worked for cars. He was first. Now he's the richest guy in the world. And, and his cars are the biggest. So yes, there's more risk to being first, but there's also a lot more reward and profit. So I would say to people, well, you know, if you want the, if you want the big prize, you've got to also take the risk of that. But certainly we don't think it is very risky because this technology worked 80 years ago. You know, we don't have to prove airships fly. They flew across the oceans on a regular basis. The only reason that we stopped using them was that oil was so cheap, everybody flew uh, jet airplanes and, and didn't want to use airships. At that time, we didn't use airplanes for cargo either. You know, it was too expensive to move cargo in airplanes. Uh, and today, uh, we're now looking at a very large amount of cargo moved in jet airplanes. Well, this is a logistical audience. So I can tell you as logistics people, no cargo has to move at 500 miles an hour, you know, or 800 kilometers an hour. It's not necessary. If, if, if you can move it uh, on a reliable basis in a reasonable time, we want the cheapest possible way of doing it. That's what logistics is about. So why should we use cargo jets? I mean, th this is ridiculous. Uh, I'm sure that future generations will look back and say, what crazy people they were in the 21st century using cargo airplanes uh, to fly things. Uh, so we'll use the, the airships for cargo. Thank you, Barry. You know, the, another question is, what do you think are the very first steps to invest in air um, in airships, in airships? Well, it's, it's like, a, it's a brand new transportation system. And that means you've got to put investments in a lot of places. You know, we need to have the ground handling facilities. Uh, in the north here, we need to have a big hangar, like the one in the picture, for the airship to be built in. So that's part of the investment. Uh, there has to be the, the learning again. I mean, the airships were built so long ago, there's nobody alive who even remembers them. If we didn't have pictures of airships from the past, we would think it was a myth. But you know the but the science is very much known. We have the engineering skills. Uh, but to come to your point, the first point, obviously we start out with the engineering and the simulation and with smaller airships and we build up to the bigger ones. Uh, we think the first airship that would be sort of a commercial airship would lift about 30 tons. And so you would start with a 30 ton lift airship and you'd move up. We don't know how big they could get. Uh, we think that they might get up to you know, the 250, 400 ton size in which they'd be much, much less expensive than trucks uh, and of course uh, uh, more competitive. But I'm not sure I answer your question, but it's, you know, you've got to invest in many different places. And also I would say, it isn't just the private sector. The government also has to invest. You know, the government builds roads, the government builds airports and seaports and, and so on. The government has to have a role in producing the locations for the airships to land uh, and maybe for some of the hangars as well. And, and some incentive to reduce the risk to get something started, uh, which is uh, what also is really important. Thank you, Barry. There are many questions, you know. Uh, at this time, uh, our colleague, Eric Moreno, uh, is uh, uh, questioning something. Uh, Hello, Professor Frontis. Once uh, trucks deliver cargo, they are ready to go back for another shipment. In the airship, once the airship delivers, uh, is it really ready to continue shipping? Yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, it has to because the airship has a constant lift. So if you take all the cargo off and put nothing on, the next stop is heading for Mars. 
it just keeps going up until it bursts. So you have to put some cargo back on or something, water or rocks or whatever. You've got to put the equal weight back on. So it actually is encourages two-way trade all the time. So it would be loaded up with something else to come back. And, and we have lots of trade between Canada and Mexico. So uh, there's no problem finding something to move. Yeah, uh, Professor Prontiz, two questions. <laughs> now, the, the, the first one is, what is the what do you think is the role for academics to to be part of this uh, challenge? How the universities can be part? Well, I think you know partly what I'm doing now. You know, the the new ideas come out of the universities, and we're not afraid of uh, of what the invested interests might say. I mean, the people who own trucks might not want us to talk about this. The, the people who own airplanes, they may not want to talk about this. They've got their own businesses already, and this is a new competitor that might face them. At the universities, we don't care. Uh, we look at the facts. Uh, we look at what can be new. We look at what can be done. Uh, so again, uh, I would say from the part of, of uh, academics in Mexico, you know, imagine where the airships could use for moving goods from Mexico, not just to Canada, but to Europe or to South America and other goods. I mean, you might move things other than, uh, I talk about fruits and vegetables, but furniture, for example, things that are bulky, that can be made uh, and, and would be made better maybe in Mexico than, than in Canada. But because of their size and their, their dimensions, you can't ship them economically in a truck. So anything that's very bulky could go in an airship. And uh, this is an advantage from a logistics perspective. Uh, maybe for that matter, even uh, things uh, uh, like wind turbine blades. You know, we, we wanna use more wind power, but the length of the blade limits where you can put them because you can't get to the, the road system. Well, the airship could lift them right there. So. There's many applications for airships beyond just the fruits and vegetables. I, I have a, a special love for that because I guess I like uh, eating my fresh vegetables in the wintertime. But there's many uses for the airships and there are many opportunities in Mexico to look at what are these other applications uh, as well. Okay, you, you know, uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Ernesto Lagarda, um, which is professor in, uh, at the Itzon, uh, an institution located in the state of Sonora, uh, tells you that they are ready to support this uh, interesting challenge. <laughs> Last question, uh, a colleague from the University of uh, Yucatan. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Barry Prontiz. Greetings for, uh, from the Wadi, the University of Yucatan. My question is the following. What will be the challenges to face in terms of air flight restrictions and fiscal regulations and between Mexico and Canada? Well, obviously we have to cross the US. <laughs> so <laughs> that's always a, an issue for us because we have this big guy in between us. But we do have already treaties. You know, you can fly airplanes over the US. Uh, airships are recognized as an aircraft. Uh, all we have to make sure is that the airships that are certified to operate in Canada or Mexico are consistent with regulations in the US and we can fly straight over. There should actually be no restrictions whatsoever in terms of, of the flights. I'm glad to hear someone from the Yucatan because it also is an area that's difficult. I mean, you, it's hard to transport by truck from the Yucatan all the way to Canada, but it's actually pretty close. You can go straight north. So uh, the ability to move things from Yucatan to Canada, again, uh, uh, would be an opportunity for papayas, for example, are produced in, in Yucatan. That would be one of those products that could move in large quantities. Um, I don't think that we really have too many flight restrictions. If worse came to worse, we just go in the ocean all the way around the US. So there you are. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Uh, it was a very great honor to have you here between us and, and this uh, 10th anniversary of the C-Log. So thank you very much. And uh, we will be in touch. Well, thank you so much to everyone for inviting me. It was a, a, a placer muy grande para mí. 
y voy a, a, a trabajar más en mi español y tal vez en el futuro puedo charlar directamente en español a, a, y espero que el día que viene. Por favor, hablas muy bien. Gracias.